Good morning, Battle Creek Church. If you'll stand here, if you don't worship, we're going to worship our good and our faithful God this morning, who is worthy of our praise and our song. Give you glory for all you brought me through. And now I'm ready for whatever you want. I'm moving forward to follow after you. Yeah. And now I'm ready for whatever you want to do. Rising, you're rising higher with power to 
say with the power to say Who else is 
There's no one worthy, no one worthy of our praise than Jesus. Because of what he's done, our response is, is to worship. And I would challenge you this morning as we continue to worship, if you feel comfortable, let's all raise our hands together and sing worthy, worthy of it all, he who is. You're worthy of it all You're worthy of it all For from you are all things And to you are all things You deserve the glory
God, you are so good to us. And we certainly don't deserve it, but God, you stepped down out of heaven, sent your son Jesus for us. God, we lift your name high right now. And we just thank you for who you are to us in Jesus name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Church, you can grab a seat. So glad you're here worshiping with us today. Welcome to Battle Creek, everybody. My name is Jared. If we haven't had the chance to meet and I'm your campus pastor here at BA. And if you are new with us, I would love to know that you are here today. You can let me know by texting the number you see right here on the screen, or there's a connect card in the seat back in front of you that'll allow us to reach out and connect with you and say thank you for being here with us today. I would love to the opportunity to be able to do that. There'll be a bucket you can drop that card in on your way out uh, here in just a little bit. Uh, today, we're kicking off a brand new series called Reconstruction. And I'm really looking forward to this series, but along with this, is that there's more to it than just being here on Sunday. If you're not in a community group right now, I just wanna encourage you to get in one because we believe that life is better together and doing life alone, you just miss out. And here's the deal, here's why getting in a community group is important. Uh, a few weeks ago, a family shared with us that their son, uh, this family actually experienced a parent's worst, worst nightmare. Their 13 year old son Langston uh, went into cardiac arrest had gone out for a run, came back inside, went into his room. His mom heard him shout out. She ran up to check on him and he was completely unresponsive. So of course they call 911. She's doing chest compressions to, to try to get him back. The, the EMS showed up, they get him to the hospital. They worked on him for nearly 45 minutes, not knowing what was gonna happen in this young man's life. Thank God they were able to resuscitate. He lived in an induced coma for about 48 hours. Yeah, you can give it up to God for that part of the story for sure. He was in an induced coma for about 45, 48 hours. And one thing that was so cool to see in this process is that Langston had community. As you can see the picture here on the screen, some of his community groups showed up at the hospital. They weren't even able to go in the room, but they were able to sit with his parent, Langston's parents in the waiting room and pray for him. And then they showed up again a few weeks later with even more people there to pray for him. This is the power of community and being there for one another. Because the thing is, Jesus told us in scripture, it's not a matter of if things are going to happen, troubles will come and you do not need to do it alone. We need people that will encourage us, that will challenge us, that will pray with us, that will be there for us when things are good as well as when things are bad. And I'm happy to report to you that Langston is on an incredible road to recovery. His uncle is sitting right back here right now and said that when the doctor showed up recently, they had these plans for him and said, hey, the accomplishments that you've made over the weekend actually throw all my plans out the window because you've progressed. And that is a testament to the goodness of our God that when we stand together, when we we pray and believe that God will do miracles. He will, but you need people around you that can do that. Don't do life alone. Get in a community group. And so join us in praying for Langston, but also get in a community group for yourself. You can go to battlecreekchurch.com slash groups or that same connect card I mentioned just a little bit ago. Fill that out so we can help you find a group to do life with these people. And today, church, as we give, I just want to remind us of maybe a familiar verse. Pastor Alex actually preached on this verse not too long ago. Psalm 23, chapter 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack for nothing. That's a declaration that we can make as we give. It is a reminder to us that our giving reminds us of how good our God is, that we lack for nothing, that he promised that he would meet every need that we have. And so as you give today, Make that declaration for yourself that the Lord is your shepherd and that you have everything that you need. As you see on the screens, you can give online by going to our website or just use that offering envelope and drop it in the bucket on your way out today. But without further ado, let's join up for week one of Reconstruction with Pastor Alex right now.
Well, good morning, church. It's good to be back with you this morning. And uh, I would love to, before we pray together, just give you a brief update. As you know, I was in Egypt uh, uh, all of the week before uh, last, and uh, it had been 14 months uh, since I'd been there. We had quite a year in in 2023 in in my own household. And so I, I was there in January, and only in January, 14 months later, I went back and uh, it's remarkable to see how far they have come in, in the last 14 months. Some of you uh, are grandparents and you, you get to see your grandchildren like once a year and, and you, in your mind, you're like, holy cow, what happened to that kid? They're no longer a kid, uh, they, they, they're now a toddler, or they're now a teenager, et cetera. But when you watch it day by day, it's hard to see the growth. But, but in this year, going back 14 months later, how far they've come. I spent a whole day, all of the staff from all of the locations uh, came together, about 100 25 people. And I spent a whole day with them on Wednesday, just pouring into their lives and watching uh, what God was doing. It was incredible to do that. And then the next day, this is what you were really praying for. Uh, over 1400 pastors from all across the Middle East. Uh, I got to minister to and, and uh, preach to and share the word of God with. And, and it, it's, it's short uh, of only heaven of what we experienced in that moment. So thank you for praying. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that happened while I was giving the 120 staff, many of them new uh, to the organization, giving them just the history over the last 20 years of what we've done there and how uh, their little chapter of where they're entering this thing called TC Egypt exists in a big uh, story. Uh, I I talked to them about our heart years ago for adoption and foster care. And God led me years ago to begin praying uh, that he would open the door for those two things in the Middle East. Now, if you know anything about Islam or the Middle East, that is, that's not happening. Uh, and the backstory of that is Muhammad wanted his adopted son's wife. And so he declared that adoption does not exist and it's illegitimate so that he could take his adopted son's wife as his own. And consequently, over the history of Islam, adoption does not exist. Fostering does not exist. So I was telling this story. In fact, we, we met years ago uh, with people very high up. Condoleezza Rice was involved in this whole conversation about U.S. aid. And, and, uh, and then the world blew up and Afghanistan and all of that happened. And, and we got sidetracked. So I'm just mentioning some of the history. I haven't thought about that in a few years, actually. Uh, but it's something God led us to pray for a number of years. And, and at the end, several staff members came up to me and showed me uh, the article from the paper in Egypt, national paper that day, that we week before the very first case of foster care in Egypt ever was happening. And it was declared across uh, the news. And so it never ceases to amaze me what what God can do. And when he puts something in our hearts to uh, pray about, uh, and and then years later, he's bringing some of those things to fruition. And so I, I just want to thank you for your prayers over the last few weeks. I want to ask you if you would go ahead and take a knee at your chair at all of our campuses and bow your heart before the Lord. And as we begin this new series, uh, no doubt you, you know somebody or acquainted with somebody or know somebody who knows somebody who, who is dealing with the subject matter that we're going to talk about over the next few weeks. And so uh, as God lays somebody on your heart, would you just pray that he would minister life to them? And that his, him by his spirit and the presence of his spirit w- would come and touch uh, that man or that woman or that boy or that girl and, and minister God life, Zoe life uh, to them. And would you just declare to the Lord today that you are an open uh, vessel, ready to receive the word of God that will change your life, ready to uh, receive the ministry of the Holy Spirit that you would submit under the leadership of God in your life and under the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life and and declare that the word of God uh, is the word of God. And we will bow before it and we will do what it says and, and follow it, believing in faith that that's the way of God. And so Lord, bless our church today. Protect it at every front and on every avenue. And in this service, may you be exalted and lifted up. In Jesus' name we pray. And together we all say amen and amen. Let me begin with a couple of questions, okay? Just show of hands, all campuses. How many of you would say that you have at least 
heard of the idea of deconstructing your faith? Just raise your hand. You've heard of it before, okay? Most of you in, in, in the room. How many of you would say, I think I know someone who has or is uh, deconstructing their faith? Just put your hands up, okay? A little less of you. Uh, how many of you would say that you could confidently define deconstructing your faith? R raise your hand. Yet it's a phenomenon right? In our world and in Christianity. And that's why I want to spend a few weeks discussing this topic. And over the course of this series, we're going to attempt to define it for you. But today I really want to talk about the why. Why are, are we going to talk about what we're going to talk about? Because the why behind the what is even more important than the what. And the why is directly linked to a set of statistics. And I know statistics. I know, I know, I know. Just, just stick with me uh, for a moment. But I, I want to begin with this statistic. In the early 90s, uh, does that say 90s? I don't even know what that means. Uh, <laughs> Something happened, uh, but, but that's, we're, we're speaking in tongues. In the early 90s, 90% 90 of Americans claimed to be Christian, okay? And, and that meant they believed in God, they believed in Jesus, they attended church, they, at least some of the time, right? They prayed sometimes, they served somewhere, but, but over the next 20 years, that number would shrink dramatically. A, a, in fact, I'm going to interpret for you. By, by 2020, that number was down to just over 60%. 60%, 90% to 60%. Now, what happened? And, and where did they go? And, and by the way, one would think, uh, logically, that for that number to go down, you would think another number is going up right? Like another religion, like they were leaving Christianity and they went to Judaism or Islam or even Buddhism, right? But, but here's what the researchers found, that, that the fastest growing group in the country were the nuns. Now, not the nuns, N-U-N, but the nun, N-O-N-E. In other words, those who responded none when they asked what they were. What, what do you believe? Nothing. What, what do you believe in? No one. Where, where do you attend? Nowhere. In, in fact, that group in, in the uh, 90s barely registered <laughs> less than 5%, okay? Less than 5%. By, by 2002, I, I'm sorry, 2000, yeah, by 2002, it, it was 30%. Today, in 2024, nearly one-third of all Americans say they don't believe in anything. And when asked why, the answers are so interesting, but because only a few of them would say, I don't believe in God anymore. Half would say, I do not like the political positions of some churches and, and, and some Christians. But well over half, the main reason they don't believe is they question their religious beliefs. And quite honestly, they've become dissatisfied with the answers that the church has. Now, here's the thing you got to know. Th this group did not just show up one day. Th these weren't people who never went to church. These are, these are people who many of them went to church and many of them regularly, but, but now they don't. A and they didn't just wake up one day and say, I'm done. They probably were wrestling with it. They thought through it. They considered it. And for one of many reasons, they came away with many, many doubts and, and not enough reasons to keep going to church. A and the culture has a name for all of this. And, and the name is deconstruction right? Or deconstructing your faith. And, and the reason defining this is so hard, and no one could raise their hand earlier, right, is because this is like trying to nail jello to the wall. Uh, and to come to some sort of common definition of this term would mean that we would have to agree on all the terms in the definition. But we just don't have time in this series to do that. So for the case of this series, or for the sake of this series, we're, we're going to say it this way. Deconstruction means wrestling. It means wrestling with what do I really believe. And just so you're clear, in my mind, deconstruction is stage two of a three-stage journey in life. <clears throat> Take religion out of it. Okay, take faith out of the illustration for a moment. In society, what happens is this. Our parents raise us 
with a set of beliefs. And it may be conservative, it may be progressive, it could be anywhere in between, but they raise us. In other words, there, there is a construction that happens in all of our lives. And at some point in our lives, we, we begin to question, is that what I believe? Is that just what my parents believe? Do I still believe that? That's called deconstruction, right? We take it apart, we examine it. We, we see why we believe what we believe, why we don't believe what we don't believe. And that is us putting together what we do believe. Believe. This is what I really do believe, which is reconstruction. And, and, and here's what my parents gave me that I want to keep, right? And here's what my parents gave me that I don't want to keep. And here are the things that I found that have been really helpful to my life. Here are the things that are actually really important to me. But, but look at this steps. Deconstruction is not the end goal. It, it's a step along the way. It, it, the end point needs to be a stronger faith. And whatever you think or feel about that word, can I just say from the outset, it is not healthy to stay in a state of deconstruction. We want you to go from deconstruction to reconstruction. We, we want you to go from doubt to faith. We want you to go from question to confidence. We want you to be like that father who wanted his son healed and cried out to Jesus, hey, Jesus, I do believe, but would you help my unbelief? And what we want to be and have wanted to be from the beginning of the, uh, of the church at Battle Creek is to provide a place where you can doubt in a safe place, where you can ask questions and get answers to your questions. And in fact, those who are deconstructing their faith, many of them are leaving their churches. And it's not because they suddenly don't like them anymore or they completely disagree with them on all fronts, but, but it's because they're not comfortable in the church. And I'll be honest with you, over the, the history of the, the Capital C Church, the church has kind of a history of shutting down doubt altogether. And again, you can think of or define deconstruction in a whole host of ways, but at the heart of it is taking something apart. And if you're like me, when something in your home breaks, the smart thing to do is to pick up the phone, make a call and call an expert. And the expert shows up and fixes it. But if you're like me, sometimes you ignore that advice. <laughs> and the first thing you do is begin to take something apart, trying to figure out why it's broken and try to fix it on your own. I have about 22 hours in an espresso machine. Now, when you do the math on that, it's a bad investment, but I fixed it, okay? Finally, I fixed it. I called an electrician to come over and watch me fix it and coach me in the process because that's how stubborn I am. But, but you don't take something apart if you're not an expert, or at least you have an expert present right there. Why? You might not be able to get it back together again. In fact, there are three screws left. And, and when you lift the lever to put the pod in, you can't lift it all the way because the pod will fall all the way through now. But, but that's why we have to do this whole deconstruction thing in the midst of biblical community. Listen, what happens when, deconstruct, uh, when people deconstruct in an unwise way or all by themselves is they end up isolated and they end up becoming prey to a very real enemy. And they end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater because they took their faith apart and couldn't get it back together again. And the problem with deconstruction is not the questions. And it's not the doubt. The faith can handle the questions and the faith can handle the doubt. It's leaving it in a deconstructed state. And I need you to hear me. That's exactly what your enemy wants for you. And that has been his MO since the very beginning. In fact, let me show it to you uh, again. I feel like we come back to this verse all the time, but it's so fundamental to our faith. We have a problem here in the teleprompter. This is Genesis chapter three and, and, and verse one. The serpent was the shrewdest. I want you to circle that word in your Bible. Was the shrewdest of all the animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked Eve, he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? This is how it starts. A simple question that leads to doubt. Now, Eve, we know this, should have said, nope, he didn't say that by Felicia, right? But, but instead, he started, she started listening to the devil and she entertained a conversation with the devil. And, and you know what? He, he, he said we could eat anything except for that one thing. And then she begins to wonder, I wonder why God doesn't want us to be happy. 
And, and something else you see, I want you to see in, in this, th this term, by the way, in the Hebrew is the word Aram, E-R-U-M in Hebrew. It has the exact same root as another word that appears a few verses later in verse seven, and it's the word we translate naked. In fact, in Hebrew, these words sound identical to one another, and there is a play on, on these words. In other words, in trying to be clever, they ended up naked. And you have to hear me. We don't want anyone to have a naked faith, to be unguarded in life, to be vulnerable to, to the enemy. Listen, it's okay to have questions. But with your questions, you need to seek answers. And in this series, what I want to do is talk about some of the biggest questions that people in general have felt like they never got answered. And in the surveys and in the questions and in the research, overwhelmingly, the top reason people give for, for leaving the church is that there can't only be one true religion. And by the way, our culture is leading us there by a leash, right? That can't be true. That somehow it's so wrong for you to think that you're right and your way is the only one that's right. It's incredibly arrogant uh, for you to believe that your beliefs are superior to anyone else's beliefs. And it's even more arrogant to try to convert them to your way of believing. So if you think your religion is the one true religion, then you have to be and are necessarily wrong. Now, here's what's wrong with that belief. All, all religions claim to be the one true religion, right? It's not that Christianity claims that all by itself, so cross them off the list and pick from the rest of them. Every religion claims, and any religion that doesn't is, well, well, look, people don't join Judaism or the Muslim faith or the Buddhist faith because they're all going, hey, guys, we're not the real religion, but come on in. That's not what's happening. They all say that they are the one true religion. In fact, to take it one step further, I, I, I want you to think about this. To claim that all religions lead to the same place is just as intolerant as, as saying that this religion is the only true religion. It's just as intolerant. And to say that all uh, religions have the truth, and any religion that claims to have the truth is wrong means that every religion is wrong because every religion says that. But let's look at what's really at the heart of it. Instead of saying there's more than one true faith, we need to first see why we believe our faith is the one true faith. Now, turn over in your Bibles to 1 John. Okay, not the gospel of John, but towards the back. First uh, John, this is a letter, not a gospel. Okay, This is one of the letters that John wrote by the apostle John to his church. And it's written late in the first century, maybe as late as 90 AD. And that means that nearly everyone else who saw Jesus is now dead. He's the sole living one who, who saw Jesus Christ. And he writes to those who never saw Jesus in the first place. Okay. And so let's look at what he has to say to them. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. That's Jesus, right? Whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. Now, what you're going to see here is that John is going to make two claims about Jesus Christ. First, he's going to make the claim that Jesus did exist. In scholarly circles, we call this the historical Jesus. And people spend their whole life studying the historical Jesus. And even atheists who don't believe that he is God cannot deny that he did exist. But what John says is you can trust our report. Why, why can you trust our report? Because we have seen him and we have heard him, right? Not only that, we, we saw him with our own eyes and we touched him with our own hands. Now, the second claim that, that he is going to make is one that he already made in the gospel of John. In John chapter one, <coughs> excuse me, the, the gospel of John, you see that he says the very same thing about Jesus, right? He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jump down to verse 12, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's exactly what he's saying here in, in, in this letter in 1 John. He, he's saying that he is the one who existed from the beginning, and he is the Word 
of life. And he can say that not because he's a theologian, but because he was a friend of Jesus while Jesus was on earth earth. Now, now go to verse two and look at what he says. The one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the father and then he was revealed to us. Verse three, We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard. There's those words again, seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. In other words, this isn't a scheme. We didn't make this thing up. It's true because we saw it and we heard it. And this is John, here's my first point today. This is John telling us how we know it's true. And he is reassuring us that what we have is actually the truth. But, but big question, who is this we that John is talking about? And, and to get that answer, we really have to go back to the Gospels. And by the way, the Gospels are not just religious texts. They're historical documents as well. In fact, Luke tells us at the beginning of his gospel, as he does at the beginning of Acts, I have done a thorough, thorough investigation of all the firsthand eyewitness testimony. And that's what the gospels really are. In fact, that you need to think of this we, this, this groups of people in concentric uh, circles, right? You, you got the crowds or the multitudes that heard and saw uh, uh, Jesus. 500 of them, that's 500 uh, uh, of them. This is like Christmas over and over and over again, like a surprise coming, right? That, that 500 of them saw Jesus ascend, right? They saw him in a resurrected uh, state. Then the, the 150, 120, 120 in the upper room, right? We're gathered in the upper room. Of the 120, 72, 72 <laughs> of this group was sent out while Jesus was still on earth. Write these numbers down because I'm going to give them to you correctly verbally, right? Then, then you have the 12, the, the, the 12 of them were his closest followers or were his disciples. And of the 12, right? Of the 12, you got three which were his closest friends. We should do this every week. (laughs) Peter, James, and John, right? Now from this group of people, the 12 and the three, this is what I want you to see. Who knew him the best came all the writings of the New Testament. You you need to know that, that, that Matthew, the first gospel, right? He's one of the 12. Peter is one of the 12 who wrote some of the letters, right? Mark was Peter's close associate who wrote his own gospel. Paul, he says in 1 Corinthians 15 that he saw Jesus by himself, right? As one abnormally born or at the wrong uh, time. Luke was a close friend and traveling companion of Paul. John, we've already talked about him. He wrote the gospel of John, the letters of John, and the book of the Revelation, right? That only leaves James and Jude, who were the brothers of Jesus on earth. In other words, everyone who read the words of these eyewitness testimonies testified, yep, that's how it went. I was there. That's how it played out. And that's how we get our Bible. And there's this idea out there that the church leaders later, centuries later, sat down and they said, okay, what should be in the Bible? And you have all these councils, Nicaea and Jerusalem, and all these councils that, that they point to. And they say in those councils that the church manipulated all of this. That is a total misunderstanding of what those councils did. They never once voted on what should be in and what should be out. They merely affirmed what was already decided, what should be in the Bible. And and listen to me, the first eyewitnesses of Jesus, they not just knew about him, they knew him. And they told everyone about him. Why? Because Christianity is not intuitive. You don't, you don't just figure this out in your mind. You, you hear it from people who saw and who heard. We have to be told about it. And they told people about it. And the people that they told about it, that, that they told them that they saw and heard. And then those people saw and heard. And they shared it with others who shared it with others. And in fact, you're here today and maybe you've just come to know Jesus in the last month around here. Here's what I want you to hear today. You can trace your faith all the way back 
A few, few weeks ago, I, I talked about Jeremy and, and Wendy Hayes and all the kids that their kids have brought to Christ. And, and, and over all of these years, she posted on Facebook a week or two after I mentioned her that, that it was uh, the Flints, right? Jeremy and Jill Flint who brought them when their boys were young, who invited them to a fall in. Uh, 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 was that it or Easter? Yeah, in the fall, invited him and them and their little boys to, to come to this church. And, and the point is, is we could talk to Jeremy and Jill and find out who invited them and who, who invited them and who invited them. And we could go all the way back. In other words, you heard it from me and I heard it from someone else who heard it from someone else who heard it from someone else going back, 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 years and decades and centuries all the way back to these eyewitnesses. There is an unbroken chain of evidence and account running from the eyewitnesses all the way to this present day. That's why we know that this is true. But more importantly, in our culture today, it, it is that we, how we should show it's true. Not just how we know it's true, how we should show it's true. Now go back to 1 John for a moment, because this is why John is telling us this. Look, look at verse 3. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Jump down to verse 4. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. In other words, we want you to know so that your life is better. I, I hope you caught that. And that seems so elementary but it is so counterintuitive in the capital C church today that we share what we know to be true, not because we want to win an argument and not but because we want to debate you and come out on top. We share what we know to be true because we want you to win at life also. In other words, motivation matters. And sometimes I get the idea that some Christians are actually happy that non-believers are headed to hell. That does not look like Jesus Christ. He died so that they don't have to go to hell. <clears throat> In fact, jump down to verse uh, 18. Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us say it, church. Show the truth by our actions. In other words, we don't just say we have truth, we live it out in love to show others why it's the truth. The, the truth of God is not some sentence written on a chalkboard that we all, you know what a chalkboard is? It's not on a smart board that's written out in such a way that we all vote on it and we all agree to it, right? The truth of God is something we live out in our real lives. In fact, go back to the beginning of the message, right? What are we talking about? We're talking about reconstruction. In other words, we're not talking about winning arguments. We're not talking about convincing others we're right and they're all wrong. The, the way we show the world that our faith is the one true faith is not by arguing with them or debating with them. There's a time and a place for that. But these, though all of those words end up hollow if your motivation is not love. And so our behaviors and our attitudes and our actions actually show the world the truth. In fact, go to, go to verse 19, if you will, and look at it. Our actions will show, say it. Our actions will show we belong to the truth so we would be confident when we stand before God. In other words, one day we're all going to stand before God. And what we want to do is stand before God in confidence that we can say that not only did we know the truth, we showed the truth in word and deed and in love. And, and look, as a pastor, in, in my experience, okay, and I'm, I'm not going to put labels on people. That's not what I'm going to try to do today. I, I want to be compassionate and help you understand. From my experience, okay, I'm speaking of my own personal experience with people, of people who are dealing with some level of deconstructing or another. I, I think over the years, what I can do is confidently put them into a few categories of people. And, and the first category of people is people that have doubts. They're wrestling with, with, with some things. And here's what I need you to hear. It's okay to have doubts. 
I gave a whole Easter sermon a year ago to, to those who have doubts, right? The gospel is filled with people who deal with doubts. In fact, Jude instructs us to be merciful to those who have doubts. That's what we're supposed to do with people who have doubts. Be merciful towards them. Now, the, the second category of, uh, of people are those who are walking through what I would call some dark night of the soul. That God is withdrawing in a manifest fashion to lead them to maturity. And here's what I need you to hear today. If God has you in that stage, listen to me. He, he, he is strengthening you because he trusts you. Because he wants your faith to be more than pragmatic. He doesn't want you to show up at church and be given three things to do to love your wife better, three things to do to be a better parent, three things to do as if Christianity is some sort of a prescription. He wants your faith to be relational and he wants it to be personal. Now, the third group of people are people that I would say who are genuinely asking, sincerely asking the question, does this form of Christianity that I am living line up with the life of Jesus Christ? And can I just say to you, that's an incredibly healthy thing to ask on a regular basis. And, and, and the, the last group of people are people who are actually denying the faith. And, and the Bible says we must warn them. In fact, Jude says not just to warn them, but actually we're supposed to snatch them from the fire. Now, no matter which group you, you, you may find yourself in today, Jesus has one goal for you, reconstruction. That's his goal for you, is reconstruction, that you would have a stronger faith at the end of the journey, right? But Philippians 1 says that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it and finish you, finish it in you, right? In other words, his goal is not to leave you in a state of deconstruction. By the way, Jesus deconstructed some things in his day and age. But he always took the word of God and laid it on the culture rather than taking the culture and laying it on the, the, the word of God. And here's the point. There will be moments of doubt. Rest assured. You haven't lived any life if you've never had a moment of doubt. There will be moments of pain in your life. But Jesus loves you enough to not leave you in that place. Do you remember at the end when he was talking to Peter and he was warning Peter? And he said to Peter, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you. And I said, yes. Think through that for a moment. Peter... Satan has asked to sift you, and I told him, yes. But don't worry, Peter. I prayed for you, and your faith will not fail. I began this in you, and I will complete it in you. And listen to what he says to Peter. And when you return, you will be stronger. And when you are stronger, you will be able to strengthen your brothers. By the way, he, Jesus is praying for you. He's praying for your kids. He's praying for your grandkids. He, he, we still have a Messiah who is interceding on, on our behalf. By, by the way, that word in Luke where Jesus says that Peter's faith will not fail, that, that word that's translated fail in, in the Greek is eklipo, eklipo, which is where we get our English word eclipse. We just had it, right? I don't know where you went or where you traveled to see it, and maybe you made the journey to totality. But the eclipse is where the moon, the, the moon comes in front of the sun, right? For a few minutes. I was cracking up, by the way, of all of the conspiracy theory stuff. Where are those people today? They were saying during the eclipse, they were going to solve all the world's problems. That's a lot of pressure for four minutes. <laughs> but for four minutes, the moon got in front of the sun. For a few minutes, it was dark. It was hard to see. And it looked like, here's the point, it looked like the sun left. 
In fact, that Greek word that's translated fail in this gospel can also be translated to mean abandon. But here's what I want you to see today. The sun didn't leave. It was just covered up for a moment, right? But, but once the moon was no longer in front of the sun, the sun came back. Listen to me, church. In the very same way that Satan wanted to sift Peter, you can mark it down. He wants to get between you and the sun, the S-O-N and disappoint you to the greatest degree that you can imagine. He wants to do that. His great goal for you in your life is to put things between you and the son that you will interpret are bigger than God. And my prayer in this series is that you will not enter into, you have not entered into a contract with Jesus, but a relationship with him. And maybe even now, just now, you're realizing that part of your faith or even part of your life is in some sort of state of deconstruction. And you've left it there. You haven't worked on it. And here's my challenge to you. Would you commit during this series to start the process of reconstruction? To not just leave your faith in a heap on the side of the road in a ditch. And more than that, to seek a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe a new one, never had it before, genuinely, or or, or a renewed one. Would you pray with me across all of our campuses today? And as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, would you open your heart to what the Lord may want to do in you today? And if you're here today and you've realized you don't have a faith, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, can can I lead you down that path today before we say amen? You want to give your life to Jesus. You want to trust Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Would you just pray with me? In fact, I'm going to pray a prayer one phrase at a time. And I want you to pray it after me, but what I don't want you to do is just to pray it in some rote fashion. I want you to pray it to God in heaven. At every campus, you're going to hear men and women and boys and girls pray. But if that's you, you want to trust Christ today, would you pray with me and say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner, but today I ask you to forgive me for all of my sin. Jesus, come into my life to be my Lord my savior and my forgiver in the best way that I know how I trust you alone Jesus to save me thank you for saving me in Jesus name we pray now before we say amen would you just add this prayer to to all of your lives the same thing we started with where that young man Uh, that man with his little boy was praying to Jesus. Would you just say all across the church, Jesus, I believe. Would you help my unbelief? In Jesus' name we pray. And together we all say amen and amen. Would you thank the Lord today for ministering life to people? Campus pastors, come if you would. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, just want you to know how proud of you we are. And the Bible says there is a party going on in heaven for you. And while you've begun this relationship with Christ, we want to help you begin to grow in your relationship with him. So would you let us know that you made this decision? Grab that connect card from the seat back in front of you. Drop it in the bucket on your way out after you filled it out. That way we can show you some next steps that you can begin to take to grow closer to Jesus. Guess what? Last what? Last week we asked you to commit to being here all four weeks. You get to mark one off the list here. I just want to encourage you, be back for every week in this series so that you don't miss out. And again, if you are not in community, get in community. We've got a couple of pastors uh, out at a booth out in the lobby. Stop by, talk to them. They'll help get you connected. Thanks so much for being here today. Hope you have a great rest of your Sunday, and we'll see you next week.